event, which is itself uh, an event that is very close to our hearts and indeed to our own intellectual project at the Humanities Center. I think uh, I, Professor Duwe Ming requires no formal introduction, but then I think he does require an introduction because he always does things afresh, anew. He builds original and unexpected links between various civilizational discourses and is amongst the most treasured colleagues at Harvard. I only got to Harvard six, seven years ago and when I came here, it was apparent to me how many people's paths had crossed his and how many people's work had been influenced by his work. So I felt myself deeply fortunate when we met and indeed to have your hospitality, to have your support for the Humanity Center and in, to have your presence here today in a center which I hope very much follows the tenets of what you have yourself done in your work and institutionally, which is to create a crossroads across the sciences, the arts, the arts and sciences of faith and religion, as well as the aesthetics of culture. I don't think a formal introduction plays as much a part in this very special event as indeed the presence of the papers that we will be reading and the discussions that we will be having, which are much fuller ways of encountering the work of somebody who is at the forefront of cultural boundaries and cultural territories, and how in order to work from tradition to tradition, we have to take up the enormously onerous but essential necessity of translation. Translation not only in trilingual translation, but translation as a cultural metaphor of both the desire for communication, but at the same time, the desire to lead certain things to be in the way in which they were. So the real Respect of translation is also to respect the untranslated. The labor of translation is not always to give everything an audibility that would make it immediately uh, understandable, but to allow texts and meanings and traditions to set their own times of emergence. Translation is really about that kind of temporality and nobody has embodied such values in my view, and this is only, of course, a very small uh, tribute, but nobody has given language, philosophy, con and concept the time of emergence, allowing it to come to fruition, allowing it to flower, as has Professor Duwe Ming. Professor Duwe Ming is Harvard Yenching Professor of Chinese History and Philosophy, and of Confucian Studies, and was director of the Harvard <laughs> Influential <laughs> Institute from 1996 to 2008. He grew up in Taiwan, received his BA in Chinese study, to give my pronunciation at Tunghai University, and his MA and PhD at Harvard. Taught Chinese intellectual history, Chinese philosophy, and Confucian Studies at Princeton from 67 to 71 and at the University of California, Berkeley, 1971 to 81, before joining the Harvard faculty. He has also taught at Peking University, Taiwan University, the Chinese University of Hong Kong, and the École des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales. And uh, Professor Tuwe Ming is now 
on his way to create a new foundational institute in the humanities at Peking University. Professor Tu Wiming holds honorary professorships from Zhezing and Renming Universities and the Shanghai Academy of Social Sciences and has been awarded several honorary degrees in the US and China. Published many books, both in English and Chinese, and more than 100 articles primarily focusing on the modern transformation of Confucian humanism. A five anthology volume of his works was published in Chinese in 2001. The title of his talk this afternoon is a Confucian reflection on the Enlightenment mentality in China. Thank you very much for being here. Please let us begin. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Homi, for such a generous uh, introduction. Uh, what I would like to do is uh, very simple, since uh, many of you, uh, at least uh, several of you, have uh, already read uh, some of my reflections. I will begin with a very brief account of uh, Confucian humanism, as I understand it, and then just uh, put the question uh, on the floor for a general discussion. And I was uh, invited by the American Humanist Association to receive an award. In that award, I began with a statement which nobody really liked, and some people even decided to walk out of the room, that Confucian humanism, unlike secular humanism, uh, characteristic, of course, the Enlightenment mentality of the modern West, is a comprehensive and integrated vision of the human condition. Uh, such a form of humanism in the word of uh, uh, Professor Bharasubhamanya, a great uh, Vedanta scholar in, uh, in India, it is a form of uh, spiritual humanism. And in this sense, it may be useful simply to note that uh, Confucians in traditional Chinese society assumed a variety of roles throughout their lives. Uh, as scholar officials, they showed the political responsibilities and performed their educational functions in society. Like Indian gurus, they were teachers. Like Buddhist monks, they were ethical exemplars. Like Jewish rabbis, they were learned scholars. Like Greek philosophers, they were wise men. Like uh, Christian priests, they were spiritual leaders. And like uh, Islamic mullahs, they were uh, community leaders. However, in the final analysis, their commitment to the improvement of the world here and now compelled them to take on social responsibilities comparable to those of the modern so-called uh, scholar officials or intellectuals in China. Yet uh, their intellectual horizons, and I would say, of course, their spiritual concerns were much broader and much deeper. The uh, tradition intends to integrate four dimensions of human experience. The question of the self, community, uh, nature, and heaven. In the idealized sense, the uh, integration of the body and mind, a fruitful interaction between self and the community, but community variously understood from family all the way to the global community and even before, sustainable relationship between the human species and nature, and uh, mutuality, sometimes termed as mutual responsiveness between the human heart and mind and heaven. It is in this sense that uh, underlying Confucian education, there's a firm conviction that human beings are multidimensional. It's not a reductionist model that helps us to understand what a human being is. The human beings are not just simply rational beings or two users or endowed with uh, linguistic abilities. Human beings are necessarily aesthetic, social, ethical, historical, and spiritual. So we can fully realize ourselves from this point of view only if we take care of our body, of our heart and mind, xin, our soul, and our spirit. And each one of us should be considered, considered as a center of relationships. 
And so unlike many other great spiritual traditions, the Conf Confucian humanism takes uh, primordial ties, or we may call it unavoidable constraints, such as uh, race, gender, age, language, place, class, and faith, significantly as constitutive parts of a concrete living human being. Normally, we think it's a good idea for us to be able to transcend all these constraints. But the Confucian position is that these constraints can also be turned into enabling constraints. They, in fact, could be transformed into vehicles of uh, self-realization. And therefore, the belief that uh, each one of us is unique and uh, we are as different as our faces, and yet as humans, either from an evolutionary or a creationist perspective, we are expression, expressions of what the Confucians would call the oneness of principle and the multiplicity of its manifestations. So the sameness and diversity of difference, the, uh, uh, the one and the many are some of the central concerns. Learning in the Confucian tradition is learning to be human, and that idea of learning permeates all aspects of Confucian culture. It may have been one of the great uh, legacies of the Confucian tradition for East Asia as a whole. Maybe the great strength of East Asia uh, in, in its intellectual and spiritual self-definition is uh, the idea of a learning civilization, especially in the modern times. Uh, they learn uh, in Japan, learn from um, the Netherlands, from England, from France, from Germany, and of course, re recent years from the United States. The very first character in the Analects is uh, the word Xue, which means learning. And of course, the description of Confucius' life history, you know, from 15 to, the seven, to 70, all these decades, he tried to learn to be better human beings. But from this perspective, not only a person, but also a family, a community, a nation, a region, and the world must also learn. All human constructions, uh, economic organizations, social structures, political institutions, universities, churches, uh, philosophical systems, and ideologies are evolving processes without learning, guided by hopefully a communal critical self-consciousness, uh, they inevitably become stagnate. Learning for the sake of the self is learning to be fully human or authentically human. The actualization of humanity entails our ability to embody all forms of interconnectedness in our self-awareness and personal knowledge. Therefore, the idea of the self is always a flowing stream. It's a center of relationships. And this process of growing of the self, realizing the self's full, full potential, requires the ability to transcend not only egoism and nepotism, but also nat uh, nationalism and, surprisingly, anthropocentrism. As we expand our intellectual and spiritual horizon to incorporate an ever-expanding network of meaningful relationships into our care and concern, we gradually realize that we are integral parts of an immensely complex and yet highly differentiated, hopefully also integrated wholeness. Uh, I'll give you one, one quote from Zhang Zai in his uh, Western inscription, 11th century thinker. Uh, heaven is my father, and earth is my mother, and even such a small creature as I finds an intimate place in their midst. Therefore, that which fills the universe I regard as my body, and that which directs the universe I regard as my nature. All people are my brothers and sisters, and all things are my companions. Uh, this. Uh, both cosmological and anthropological vision suggests there are four or five features. I simply want to know them and then open up for further discussion. As a comprehensive and integrated anthropo and, co anthropo and cosmological, so I coined this awkward term, anthropocosmic vision, it embraces nature religion in its humanism. 
That's why it's not secular humanism. It assumes that a concrete living person is a central relationships. As a center, the dignity, independence, and autonomy of the individual is an essential feature of the person. As relationships, sociality is indispensable for personal identity. Third, the body is the proper home for the soul. The qi, the vital energy, is both spiritual and material. Humans are not only creatures, but also creators. And the secular is sacred because the exclusive dichotomies of body, mind, spirit, matter, creator, creature, and sacred and profane are not even a rejected uh, possibilities. Humanity, Ren, in this sense, as understood by uh, Confucian scholars ever since the 11th century, embodies heaven and earth and the myriad things in its sensitivity and consciousness. The cultivated person, then, is to seek harmony without uniformity, harmony through dialogue. Uh, what is the relevance of this uh, highly idealized uh, picture of uh, Confucian humanism to the question of China's cultural identity or the quest for cultural identity today? It is implicitly a critique of the dominant uh, intellectual force in China, which I characterize it as scientism, which uh, is a version of a rather distorted uh, enlightenment mentality. But uh, it is uh, obvious that a rather remarkable transformation on the cultural scene has taken place in the last 20 years in the Chinese mainland. And so many of you are quite familiar with this. The Confucian discourse is no longer confined to the academic community. This boundary crossing is evident in several spheres of interest, in government, business, mass media, the professions, and social movements. Virtually all major universities now have uh, a center of Confucian learning or a center of humanistic, humanistic studies or classical studies. Many institutes of higher learning offer lifelong education courses with emphasis on Confucian ethics to business executives and government officials. Books on Confucian classics are sold very well and estimated, this is an estimation, 10 million children from 8 to 13 can recite part of the four books by heart. The emergence of uh, the Confucian discourse definitely symbolizes a fundamental and thorough rejection of the anti-tradition mentality, which had been very, very um, pervasive for more than uh, at least half a century. It is also an acknowledgment by the politically concerned, socially engaged, and culturally informed elite that the ideological vacuum and the corrosive power of the market with its excessive commercialism have seriously eroded public mores and substantially undermined the effectiveness of the body politic. To the Confucian public intellectuals, beneath their apparent economic achievement, the social cost, inequality, insecurity, incivility, and uh, disharmony is very high, not to mention uh, environmental degradation and so forth. And there's a strong felt need of a direction, of a new direction, and a strong need for a new cultural identity. Concerns for the blatant lack of social capital, cultural competence, ethical intelligence, and the spiritual values at all institutional levels uh, throughout the country had to room large in their minds. So whether China is a question that weighs heavily upon the conscience of all reflective minds in the cynic world, not just in mainland China, but Taiwan, Hong Kong, Macau, Singapore, and of course the Chinese diaspora. With a view toward the future, China's modernization, in my view, cannot be guided by an unflinching faith in scientism, defined in terms of materialism, instrumental rationality, progressivism, and social engineering. I want to make a very clear distinction between scientism as an ideology, which I think is outmoded, and the scientific spirit and the importance of uh, using science as a way of guiding economic development and, and so forth. 
In a deeper sense, a critical reflection on the strengths and limitation of the modernist mentality by tapping into traditional resources, not just Chinese, but traditional resources all over the world, is both necessary and desirable for formulating a wholesome cultural identity. I believe uh, the time is ripe for the Chinese intellectuals to transcend the narrowly conceived modernistic mentality in formulating their own cultural identity with full recognition of the value of openness, cultural diversity, and self-reflexivity. It is encouraging that a critical mass of some of the most brilliant young minds has begun to learn from and interact with a variety of scholars uh, in the West, including feminists, environmentalists, religious uh, pluralists, and communitarians. Of course, including uh, postmodern uh, discourses, uh, post-colonial, and deconstructionist ideas. And yet, the desire to learn from the Enlightenment mentality of the modern West is overwhelming. And I think that's as a positive sign. But the emergence of a new cosmopolitanism is already visible. This is the question I would like to uh, open for discussion. When I say uh, the Enlightenment tradition, I mean, first of all, the great institutions, including market economy, democratic polity, civil societies, universities, bureaucracies, you know, all, the, all the things that we would talk about as forms of uh, rationalizations. But more importantly, the underlying values, the values of liberty, of equality, due process of law, human rights, dignity of the individual. But the issue now we're confronted with is that can all these institutions, all these uh, values put together be sufficient to guide China toward the 21st century? Or could all these values put together be sufficient for the human community of the 21st century? My question is, probably not. All kinds of other values and ideas and insights will have to be uh, not just incorporated to be introduced, be educated, and eventually internalized as our own values. I'll give you one example, uh, not just because homie here, that I did it a few years, quite a few years ago, about the importance of China taking India as a reference culture. By implication, a lot of Americans, Islamic, and Africa. More than a decade ago, I had the honor of visiting India as a so-called national lecturer, hosted by the Indian Council of Philosophical Research. I visited five cities, New Delhi, Madras, Lucknow, Shandaniketan and uh, Banaras, and gave uh, 16 uh, presentations at a dozen universities. Since, they, since then, I've traveled to India several times. And I'm totally convinced that it is immensely beneficial for China to take India as a reference. When I first promoted this idea 15 or 20 years ago in China, I uh, was confronted with all kinds of skepticism uh, and uh, some, sometimes even hostility. But the situation is dramatically changed in the last, say, four or five years. Not simply because of the rise of India as uh, economic power. That's only part of the story. I think implicit in this is the possibility of a new kind of uh, cosmopolitanism. And even though only a very small group of people, uh, major uh, could be considered uh, contributors to this process. If we look at this particular question, the contrast in developmental strategy, political organization, social structure, and cultural system, indeed, life approach and value orientation, provides occasion for what I consider edifying conversation. I organized two meetings over the last two or three years, entitled Indian and Chinese Philosophical Perspectives on Knowledge, Wisdom, and Spirituality. Uh, the Indian scholars uh, in their 80s and 70s and so forth could actually serve as mentors because most of the Chinese scholars were much younger 
in their 50s. Uh, very few uh, Chinese scholars in their 70s and 80s are still actively involved in intellectual reflection. Let me leave aside questions about political economy, uh, social development, uh, you know, so social organization, and, and so forth. Simply by noting a couple of things. Indian experience of colonial rule made possible for her to adapt to the British, British style of parliamentary democracy, you know, with, of course, all kinds of negative features. And this is radically different from China's sing, single party with a strong authoritarian control. The Indian democratic pra uh, practices have penetrated, I would consider, the lowest echelon of the economy. The Chinese countryside, by, by contrast, remained indigenous in governance and mentality. But the, the material resources of Chinese villages are still monopolized by the state. However, the Chinese social assistance for the last 30 years enabled China to accumulate very large amount of collective capital, which uh, facilitated China's development of a very large scale uh, industrial infrastructure. As a result, China has been able to attract a great deal of foreign direct investment. On the other hand, in terms of uh, issues such as human rights, uh, labor standards, public uh, accountability, and the question of trust, in the long run, China will have to re-examine her own strategic development. But the most noteworthy aspect of Indian experience as a source of inspiration for China is in the area of culture. The vibrancy of uh, classical dance, music, art, film, develop, uh, devotional songs, religious rituals, and sacred sites, not to mention philosophy and literature, is a testimony to the continuity and resilience of Indian spirituality. The ethical and religious landscape of India today is imbued with enduring traditional symbols, which give a rich texture to the meaning of existence as experienced in everyday life. As the Chinese intellectuals begin to awaken from their purposeful amnesia, and the calculated forgetfulness, often imposed uh, by the government toward their own tradition, as China begins to retrieve her rich heritage, they ought to take not simply the enlightenment mentality of the modern West, but also Indian, Islamic, Latin American, African, and other civilizations as references. Thank you. This is clearly a very thoughtful um, uh, and a profound uh, reflection on a whole range of issues, both philosophical and of contemporary uh, political and social importance. Um, I would also suggest that for those of us who come from a comparativist tradition, there is a number of issues here as to how we may actually do comparative literature or comparative religions. And I think that's another implication of um, this, this uh, talk that we have on the table uh, today. <clears throat> what are the most useful comparisons in a global context where there is such a, such a vociferous tendency to highlight one element in one region, another element in another, to not to universif uh, not to have I'm not uh, suggesting that we need to, to, to organically uh, wrap all these determining factors up together in one pattern, but there is an issue when you think about um, tangents of development and tangents of uh, translation, how you actually uh, construct a matrix for some kind of comparativism, and I think that's a um, uh, a, a major challenge we have today. The other issue, of course, is the, uh, I know very little about Confucianism, and most of what I know comes from uh, Duwe Ming. So in that sense, I'm already with a half within the church, or three quarters with speaking from within the church, but it seems to me there's, there's a kind of openness and flexibility 
about the uses of the Confucian tradition, from what I understand. Uh, whereas, as a form of enlightenment, whereas uh, the European enlightenment was, was faced largely with a deep contradiction, in my view. Particularly if you take the later enlightenment period, so the mid to late 18th century, not the earlier, you find that the very same societies that were producing theories of liberty were at the same, and citizenship, were at the same time involved halfway across the world in producing slaves and, and, and natives. And there is that contradiction. I mean, the fact that John Stuart Mill uh, worked in the um, uh, in the India office, uh, 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 East India Company office, that is not a scandal at all, because we all work where we can get a job. Um, and sometimes the institution is a progressive one, and sometimes it's not. But what is interesting is that the essay on liberty was written in response to Macaulay's minute on Indian education. And it's that kind of deep relationship that deep relationship between citizens in one part of the world and subjects in another that I think has made a lot of people question some of the basic <coughs> assumptions of the Enlightenment. But having said that, it is very interesting that the, the most severe critics of the Enlightenment have often suggested that it is not that we need to overthrow the Enlightenment, but what we need to do is to fulfill its best aspirations. And here I think of Franz Fanon, who was at some level a great, um, uh, a, 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 a great critic of the European Enlightenment, and yet his final uh, writings are all about trying to create a new humanism by helping or by taking Enlightenment ideas to a kind of new fulfillment and a new transcultural fulfillment. Um, so I think I would like to leave it at that. Thank you very much. And maybe open up to questions. Maybe two short comments first. Okay. Thanks a lot. Uh, I think the person, probably even more than Fernon, is Habermas. Habermas considers uh, the Enlightenment Party yet to be completed. And I'm very much uh, in agreement with him on, on that. Uh, communicative rationality, for example. But there are two very important uh, lacunae in the original conception of development, even today, with Habermas. One is the lack of concern for religion or human spirituality. You know, just like our discussion yesterday, the liberal idea, religion is a matter of the heart, should be relegated to the background. The other one is very little attention to nature, nature as our home. These are two very major lacunae. Well, the other one I simply want to mention, the implication of China's taking India absolutely seriously as a reference is really far-reaching. Then China will begin to really appreciate indigenous Chinese traditions such as Buddhism, especially Mahayana Buddhism. I'm not talking about the government or the government's policy. I'm talking about whole intellectual ethos. If some of the major Chinese thinkers now begin to take Buddhism absolutely seriously, their whole idea about Tibet will be radically different. Tibet will be considered or cherished as in, in, uh, important and enriching uh, heritage of, uh, of the tradition. Whether that will change or not, I'm not sure. But I think it's important to separate this uh, intellectual ethos on the one hand and government policies based upon all kinds of uh, considerations unrelated to human spirituality. Thank you. We'll take some questions now. Hope so. Yes. Would you introduce yourself, please? Thank you. Mm. The spread. Uh, the spread of. Uh, Could you introduce yourself and just say who you uh, are before? Okay. You say? My name is Yuan Yixi. I'm a uh, Chinese uh, visiting scholar. Thank you. Um, uh, I think the, uh, the spread of uh, computer thoughts uh, in the, um, uh, can be divided into three periods. So the first period is uh, um, the computer thoughts created uh, in uh, 
more than 2,000 years ago, um, and it was spread in China. The second period, it was spread in Asia by Mudong San and Xu Fu Guan and so on. And the, the third period is um, the computer dots was spread in was spread in um, in the world by Professor Tu Yi Ming. Um, <laughs> no, I, I, so, I so I so I um, uh, so I want to uh, ask ask question um, when when you be, um, um, Professor Tu Yi Ming. Uh, when you began to teach uh, computer philosophy in Harvard, do you think the Western people need a computer? Uh, and the second, um, do you think computer philosophy can make the world peaceful? Thank you. I don't think I'm qualified to answer either of these two questions. <laughs> but I want simply to note that uh, in the 17th century in particular, when Marty Rishi visited China and translated all these major classics uh, into Latin, uh, that introduction of Confucianism to Europe was very, very significant. Because uh, obviously, people like Voltaire, uh, Leibniz, and uh, Rousseau, uh, Kinney, the uh, uh, physiocrat, and Diderot, and Psychopedes, they were all very much aware of the tradition. So the tradition began some kind of communication long before that. And even in the 20th century, you know, numerous scholars uh, can and discuss issues. Uh, I came to the States in 62. So that was a very, very uh, late, and in a way that the, the thing I was able to do was extremely feeble. Thank you. Uh, Professor Du, could you illuminate you, David Wong, EALC? Could you illuminate us a little more regarding the relationship between Confucianism and religion, since you have talked so much about spirituality of uh, Confucianism and other uh, cultural mm -hmm. movements? Mm -hmm. Well, we understand that one feature of Western Enlightenment, at least as I understand it, is kind of polemical disengagement with religion. Yes, yes. And uh, so the question about Confucianism as a secular humanism or not, I think the question. Uh, the way that it's been framed is based upon the distinction between philosophy rooted in the Greek tradition and religion uh, rooted in the Judaic tradition. So the distinction between philosophy and religion is very clear in the modern academy. That's not true in India or in uh, many other great civilizations. I, it is all right for us to characterize the Confucian tradition not as a religion, but it's important to underscore its religious or spiritual dimension. If that aspect is not underscored, then the kind of Confucianism uh, as a form of humanism will be greatly impoverished. So normally, when someone say Confucianism is definitely not a religion, you'll know the definition of religion the questioner has is basically Judaic, um, Christian, and Islamic. But if someone says, well, Confucianism is definitely a religion, that you know the idea is so liberal, the person will include Maoism, communism, atheism, or as religions. So the question is not whether it is a religion or not. It's a question of how we understand it in terms of its uh, comprehensive nature. Um, I have three very short questions. Because the first you introduced you introduce okay. yourself and depends on how short they are. Um, um, I'm going to be a teacher in this in the ALC. First question is, I wonder whether it would be just to, um, to say that what Professor Barber said about humanism, the, the historical burden of humanism, would it be just to say that Confucianism shares similar dilemma? in the sense that historically it has been used to justify a lot of blind adherence to authority, oppression of women and all these things. And so the question is not to overturn Confucianism, but to fulfill its best aspirations in, in your fine words. Second question is, um, personally, I sometimes feel a bit queasy in the stomach when I see this pro promotion of Confucianism in China, because I don't think they're fulfilling its finest aspirations, but rather co-opting it for all kinds of 
purposes, maybe promoting again the same respect to authority that is so detrimental to our own civilization. Um, so, you know, so all this Confucius Institute in America and all that, it just makes me really a bit uneasy. So I wonder what it, to what extent Professor Du shares my um, disquiet. Third question, the last time that China took India seriously was in the 1930s with Nam Shuming and all those people, right? So what happened to that project? Why, why did it not come to a finer fruition? It was such a promising moment. So I wonder how you evaluated that moment. If all your questions are so good, you can ask another thing. <laughs> <laughs> and short and concise and uh, very challenging. Good, very good I will answer it, uh, in the reverse mm. order. Uh, no question about the fact that uh, the, that generation went to Gore actually visited China and aroused a great deal of enthusiasm. But, uh, you know, uh, Bertrand Russell and Dewey also visited China. They became much more important. That's really related to this uh, enlightenment mentality. Uh, people then accepted, including Liang Suming, that science and democracy. Democracy actually means the mass mobilization of people for nation building because patriotism. These are the important features for China. So we don't have time and energy to worry about human spirituality. Liang Suming's idea is particularly significant. He talked about three uh, life orientations. Uh, the Western, which is aggressive, progressive, Chinese, moderated, and Indian, which is uh, um, a kind of a renouncement. And he believes that China will have to learn from the West in order to survive. But eventually, in the long run, he didn't say 21st century, but in the long run, the Indian mode of contemplative, of uh, uh, spiritual self-reflection will, will be extremely powerful and important for the young. So I think uh, the uh, uh, circumstances of patriotism and the science of democracy may have contributed to the uh, decline of that particular uh, period. Now, the situation in China, including the Confucius Institutes, uh, I observe it with uh, great interest. I'm not actively involved in the process. And I don't mind if I got invited to get actively involved. Right? Uh, part of the reason is because originally, it's the idea is the, uh, is the idea of the Goethe Institute in Germany. And uh, to uh, teach uh, Chinese and to help to teach Chinese, to allow the different universities to do that. And then a number of discussions say, no, that's not enough. You really have to try to uh, raise the level. You should teach culture. Uh, you should teach uh, uh, literature, teach art, uh, teach music, and so forth. As the matter now stands, you know, it may have been promoted, uh, or oh, definitely, it's promoted by the government to present a particular image of the government, like the Olympics or like the Expo. But uh, the process for doing that is relatively open in the sense that uh, one university accepts a grant, the university can shape it the way it sees fit for that kind of uh, teaching. So what happened, we have about 70 or 80 in the United States. And as, so, as, uh, so far as I know, each one of the institutes had it, I mean, in general, by an eminent scientist of Chinese origins. And the scientist became interested in culture, but not as an expert. So he would be the chief uh, person in shaping the direction of that institute. For quite a while, leading universities uh, in America refused to have anything to do with the Confucius Institute. But the situation is also changing. Now there are about 500 institutes now. Uh, one at Waseda is totally for research. And University of Chicago just accepted one. It's also for research. It depends upon how the, uh, uh, the program uh, continues. But I think your worry about uh, cooptation, worry about especially politicization, is also my worry. And I think it's, uh, it's a very serious problem. It's related to your first question about the historical burden. And you know the burden is so heavy that for the last three generations, of uh, Confucian scholars who try to reflect upon the Confucian project, they've been dealing with th this problem. The first generation of people, pre precisely Liang Suming, uh, Zhang Junmai, uh, from 1990 to 1994, they learned from the West. They learned democracy, learned equality, 
and they criticize all these hierarchical mechanisms of control. They crit criticize the Confucian male orientation very, very thoughtfully. Uh, uh, I think Xiong Shili is even more radical than some of the liberal critics. And the second generation from 1949 to 1979, I guess, outside of uh, outside of uh, mainland China, you're quite familiar with them in, in Hong Kong, Taiwan, and so forth, Chen Mu and others, they asked the question whether this tradition uh, can, not only can be compatible with the modernizing process, but can it formulate a certain kind of critical reflection, both uh, sympathetic understanding and critical reflection on the modern, modern mentality. So uh, if you look at the tradition as a, as a very fluid process of unfolding, and certainly it's changing. Uh, my own sense is that uh, the constraints, ideological, institutional, structural, or mental constraints uh, for the Confucian tradition to remain uh, that burden imposed by, by uh, history is not that great because it's very open. Give you one example. My, my, own, my own sense is that in the next generation, all the major uh, scholars, educators, exemplar teachers of Confucianism, an overwhelming majority of them will be women uh, for the simple reasons of uh, the humanities. You know, they, they, are, they are professors of the humanities. And also for the simple reason that the tradition has been uh, historically transmitted from one generation to the other, uh, the most important um, educator in that process turned out to be the mother, uh, often the illiterate mother. So I'll give you one example, 17th century Confucian thinker, I think uh, um, his, his mother instructed him to study with the two fatherless sons of our great culture. Uh, she referred to Confucius, whose uh, father died when he was only three years old, and of course the famous uh, mother of Mencius. So that, that role as transmitter, cultural transmitter would be very, very significant. And I don't think there's any constraint if uh, someone has become a, a noted classist and uh, a noted um, interpreter of the tradition, and her power of interpretation will be just fully accepted as authoritative. I think there, the gender differentiation is not really that, uh, uh, is not really that significant. Uh, yes, I'm Nicholas Jones, um, visiting chair of Australian Studies. And in Australia, we also have many Confucius institutes now. Uh, my question really follows on from the previous question and relates to um, your point about India, um, that within Chinese tradition, it's possible to find affinities with Mahayana Buddhism, for example. And that argument could be made of other traditions as well, Islam, various kinds of Christianity, and so on. These have existed within Chinese tradition historically. Indeed, indeed, China has been cosmopolitan um, at many times in its history. Um, I'm not sure about now. And, but my question is, if is there a space for cultural diversity in China as we understand it? And if you're presenting this Confucian commitment or Confucian spirituality as coming from the heart, which you very beautifully argued for, um, that suggests to me that it's a choice. Um, and people could make other choices, other religious or spiritual choices, um, and these would then need to coexist in some way. And I wonder whether Confucianism even as an aspiration, is capable of holding um, those oppositional positions, as it were, um, and particularly within contemporary mainland China, um, where, as you've suggested, Confucianism occupies a privileged position. The, the, the scholar official um, concept is at the top, and the, the scholar unofficials, wherever they are, I'm um, not always part of that dialogue. Mm -hmm. well, let me respond at two different levels. One is uh, from the Confucian uh, life orientation itself. The other one is the actual practical implications today. 
Uh, the very fact that uh, throughout Chinese history, uh, people refer to the three teachings in one, Confucianism, and Taoism, and, and Buddhism. Uh, therefore, dual membership is very common. You be, you be both Confucian and uh, uh, and the Taoist or and the Buddhist. Uh, recently, I think I've argued most people now accept that we need to talk about five religions, not three religions in one, but five religions, including uh, Islam and Christianity. And there's no question about conflict and tension among these traditions, but uh, throughout Chinese history and the coexistence of different religious traditions has been taken uh, for granted, uh, not, not just in China, but uh, in the so-called Confucian culture area in uh, Japan, in Korea, in Vietnam. Uh, Rice Shower has made the uh, interesting observation that in, in Japan, maybe 70% of the Japanese are uh, Shintos, but uh, maybe 75% are Buddhists. And if they are Shintos and Buddhists, they never turn their back on the Confucian ethics and so forth. And so that's, I mean, from the tradition, uh, that's uh, quite, uh, I say, encouraging. The current situation in China, uh, the two problems, one, because this uh, overwhelmed concern for modernity, for development, for a market economy, uh, over, uh, sort of uh, guided by a kind of uh, uh, social engineering. <coughs> and the, using Max Weber's term, all these leaders are totally unmusical so far as religious matters are concerned. They're learning. But now they know that it's a problem, they learn, but they're not music. So that's one problem. And uh, they also consider religions, especially religions from the outside, such as Christianity, so underground Christianity, as a major threat. And now with the, with the question with uh, Tibet and the non-Chinese non speaking Muslims. So the situation is very tense uh, in, in a political horizon. But my sense is the deeper concern, if people begin to, to be more secure uh, in terms of their position. Uh, people are not restless simply in the pursuit of one unilineal uh, process of uh, development. If there's some change in that particular direction, then there will be room. I think the culture itself, you know, for a long history, the culture seems to suggest that possibility uh, is truly there. My name is uh, <coughs> Hussein from uh, Visiting scholar from Mathematics Department. So I have several questions. Uh, so when talking about the confusion, so we have uh, two stages. One is the earliest of, of confusion, 2,000 years ago. Another one is 1,000 years ago. Uh, uh, Song and Ming, uh, new, new York confusion. So could you comment on this uh, difference, uh, unities for these two stages? <coughs> because so it seems the newest one it seems more relevant modern China. And uh, uh, it looked to me that uh, the newest ones are compatible with uh, science and also the Western uh, civilization, modern science civilization. <coughs> uh, because uh, the rationalism is really a scientific. And also, uh, <coughs> confusion from my point of view is kind of uh, only uh, existing uh, culture that absorb religion into contemporary life. And that's also kind of uh, largest motivation for the modern, uh, the West modernization to search for this kind of things. As for this uh, contemporary China, uh, it seems uh, confusion is kind of compatible, uh, not compatible with communism. Because communism, uh, there are several ways. Yes, confusion uh, viewed people as the highest value, and confusion viewed people as a tool. And also, this totalitarianism uh, have a kind of organization at the lowest level. But the confusion in the culture, you have the communities. So when we turn, seems for the modern uh, uh, modernization of China, it seems to be the easy way to go return to the tradition of China, but then to modernize. Yeah. Thank you. I, uh, with your permission, I'm not going to answer the first two questions. Because the first question is like, uh, comparing uh, Catholicism with Protestantism. That, that's too big. Uh, the second one is uh, more complicated. Uh, you are, you're an expert in uh, Confucianism and in science. But the, th the third one, the uh, incompatibility of Confucianism and communism. And I think the, uh, the question is, uh, uh, to say the least, complex. And this 
an argument, I think a persuasive argument, that what Mao Zedong really contributed to, uh, to the ideological uh, debate was the indigenization or the sinicization of Marxism in China. This is Mao's contribution. So many scholars have uh, cited Mao's writings. And the, uh, uh, the Marxist-Leninist uh, 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 references are quite few, not too many. Uh, Chinese classics a lot. Uh, quotes from Confucianism, extremely extensive. So some people say without Confucianism, it's difficult to imagine that Marxism can become, could become totally indigenized as a Chinese form of communism. But my position is this. If you do not know anything about Confucianism, and you try to analyze uh, Mao Zedong uh, in terms of uh, Leninist or other kind of categories, you probably will fail. However, if you try to understand Confucianism from the Maoist perspective, it will be such a distorted version. You, you really don't know what, what's going on. So, because Mao is not just Confucianism, there's Taoism, uh, legalism, and he's basically anti-Confucian. There's no question about it, because he's anti-Chinese intellectuals in general. But the situation now uh, is more complex. There are three currents of thought, according to many arguments, liberalism, socialism, and Confucianism. In the 80s, when the liberals were the most powerful, they criticized socialism as a form of Stalin Stalinistic dictatorial control. And they criticized Confucianism as the feudal past. And they believed China's problem was the collusion of these two forces, the Stalinistic dictatorial concern and the happiest of heart or the feudal ideology, the two of them, that liberal ideas just cannot be developed. Right now, it's a new situation, you know, uh, whether you're very uh, hopeful or you're very pessimistic. The situation is the possibility of certain kind of uh, um, dialogical relationships developing up among them. Liberalism will continue to focus on the market, the open, uh, the reform, uh, learning from the West, uh, developing legal systems, developing hopefully constitutional uh, democracy or encouraging civil societies. The socialists will put a lot of emphasis on the distribution on the question of poverty, the question of the gap between the rural and the urban, and the question of uh, fairness, of equality. Uh, whereas the uh, Confucians would play some kind of role in shaping a different kind of uh, cultural identity. But this is total wishful thinking. What is happening now would be contestation, very powerful contestation. You know, they are Confucians, they're now fundamentalists. Uh, so fundamentalist. They would say, look, unless the uh, Chinese Communist Party is totally replaced by a Confucian, arist uh, not Confucian <clears throat> aristocracy, Confucian meritocracy, there's no hope for China. And the other group of people, uh, like Liu Xiaofeng, if China does not, this is all open discussion, if China is not Christianized, if China doesn't become a Christian country, there's no hope that China will ever be able to develop human rights, democracy, all these ideas. And then other, some other people believe that uh, even though uh, Marxism is no longer persuasive, and the only way out for China is uh, Chinese culture with uh, no, uh, socialism with uh, Chinese characteristics. And that socialism is uh, Marxist to the core. So I think the contestation will continue. But the, the hope is the uh, contestation, or of co course, they have all kinds of far-reaching policy implications, but not involved real uh, conflict uh, or bl bloody struggle. It will involve with argument, with uh, hopefully reasoned argument or, or shouting matches, all kinds of things, but not so divisive that uh, confrontation becomes unavoidable. Hi, uh, Joanne Baldi, I teach philosophy. Um, I'm actually interested in what you were just saying about um, liberalism, socialism, and Confucianism. Um, it seems to me that the market economy is not going to be wiped out in the near future, and nor is science. Although you mentioned maybe scientism, the critique of scientism, as opposed to science, 
I'm just wondering um, if you could elaborate what are the main challenges that liberalism poses for the new Confucians? Uh, I know the old Confu classical Confucians or the neo Confucians, but for new Confucianism and for the new spirit spirituality of new Confucianism, what, uh, what would be the main challenges of liberalism? Because it looks to me as though unless new Confuci Confucianism can accommodate some key elements of liberalism, uh, there'll be a growing rift between the realities of modern China and its ability to develop uh, a, a real state Sure. Well, I totally agree with you. I, I think uh, there are quite a number of scholars in the Confucian tradition. They, they call themselves Confucian liberals or liberal Confucians, uh, like my teacher, Xu Fu Guan. The, the idea is, I, I even have this notion, I think uh, I've discussed this before, the environment in which uh, the Confucian personality can be fully developed, the best environment is actually the liberal democratic society, uh, a society that is open, uh, that is tolerant, that allows all kinds of uh, potentiality to be fully fully developed. So I, I do believe uh, that society is more congenial than the dictatorial uh, societies in ancient China or any modern forms of authoritarianism. So the uh, continuation of the liberal mindset is critical. Unfortunately, when market economy becomes, uh, uh, has transformed China into a market society and some of the liberal-minded people who still follow Wang Hayek to the core and arguing the market is the only way that will save us. And that uh, makes me extremely worried. And uh, it's Chicago uh, uh, economic uh, liberalism rather than Harvard economic liberalism that is uh, still very, very powerful in China. And that situation may change. So if we have a more nuanced understanding of uh, the market, and the liberalists in the situation could be better. Can, can you hold for a second? Because no, no, you, no, have that's to, okay. you have to run, I, right? I can wait. Um, <laughs> no, please go ahead. And then no, we can no, come no, back. Finish the, finish well, the I, I was just going to say the recent corrections in the market would obviously give China pause as, as well as it has. Absolutely. Um, so I don't know how long the right. Chicago school will continue. But yes. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. I just, I had. Introduce yourself. I'm Janet Gatto, and I teach uh, Tibet studies and Buddhist studies in the Dindi School and in the Dindi Buddhist Study of Religion. Um, and I had two sort of disparate comments slash questions. One was maybe, um, this is really a comment, but I'm wondering what your thoughts are. Uh, is it in the kind of very visionary kind of program that you're projecting, which is you know, very, very inspiring, um, that, you know, part of what you're doing in the invocation, especially of religion in particular, and especially in the sort of use of terms like isms, Confucianism, Buddhism, that it seems a very important piece of it, but that's something that's very hard to convey, is that really the Confucianism you're talking about is a new Confucianism. It's a newly configured, it's a newly constructed one. And the same would be for Buddhism. And part of the problem that one runs into when you're looking at this historical burden is to try to make it clear that this is a this is a truly a creative and new project. And in many ways, one's borrowing a label and you're borrowing certain threads, but you're being so selective that it's it's really something new that's and very intentionally being created. But I, I think that the problem, though, in so doing, it, you know, just as like one knows when one teaches religion all the time, like I teach Buddhism, I try to say, you know, Buddhism is something that's been in shift and flux all along. There's no real thing such as Buddhism. It's always changing. But it's very, very hard to get, you know, even students in a classroom to understand that, let alone political actors. So to actually be self-conscious and say, OK, we're invoking certain Confucian values and pieces of Confucian legacy. but. We're really talking about something new, something that's borrowing major, say, components, but it's not the Confucian, it's not any kind of Confucianism from the past, per se. And for that to be a legitimate and, and trustworthy, compelling project, I just think it's hard to do, if, if I'm making my point clear. Very clear. 
And the second point is just a very different point, and but maybe related to you know when you said something about Mahayana Buddhism could be you know very very valuable component to this new sort of Chinese orientation, and that might help solve the Tibetan problem. But it's so much the Tibetan problem is so much about you know authority and nationalism and politics and all sorts of other things. And it, you know, it's so perplexing at this moment, you know, given that the Dalai Lama has gone way, way, way out on the limb, you know, and said, you know, I give up the, you know, the, the you know, request for independence entirely. And I really want to work within the Chinese state, completely accept the Chinese um, domination of the Tibetan plateau. You know, but that is completely ignored. He's just being vilified, you know, more than ever. It, it was, and, and you know, he himself recently has said he's giving up hope, which is really surprising to hear. I mean, it, it, and I feel too, it's very hard to you know, see it, it, those, those other issues, which are really just of a very different order, very hard to have hope. Yeah, I share your concern of the second one, uh, maybe just one or two comments. But I think the, uh, a new situation emerged actually in the 21st century. Uh, according to the Kuntian, uh, August Kunt's notion that uh, human, pro human uh, rationality progressed from religion, metaphysics to science, once you get to the uh, scientific age, uh, all the others could be eradicated to the background. But yet, what actually happened? in the 21st century. I think uh, uh, two features that are particularly significant. One is, of course, uh, identity politics, but the other one is religion. And each religion, you know, of, of course, all these isms occurred in the 17th century. Uh, only Christianity and with uh, ITY, right? all the other isms. But that is, uh, is a burden, but I don't, I'm not too worried about that particular label. That burden. I think uh, it depends upon our our way of doing our work in translation, in uh, communication, and in defining maybe humanities in general. For example, should the study of religion be an integral part of humanities, or simply part of a divinity school, or part of other other uh, seminaries and so forth? So I think that that's changing very rapidly. But one new situation I've never encountered before is that all the major traditions have undergone a transformation in reference to the status of the earth. This is the first time. Therefore, I, I don't think you can afford not to be an engaged Buddhist in the 21st century. You say, well, I'm still interested in the pure land and rather, rather than the red dust. It's not possible for a Christian to advocate the uh, kingdom of God yet to come, rather than to recognize that the word that is Caesar's is the word that we really have to care for. So this is, this is a totally new situation. And with this new situation, people who are interested in historical or spiritual traditions may have a significant role to play. Uh, I don't know whether Homi agrees with me. I, I think even in philosophy, in professional philosophy, there is, uh, I call it a spiritual turn. It may not be the right word. And uh, people begin to take uh, their own religious traditions absolutely seriously now. Charles Taylor, Catholicism, uh, Derrida, uh, Judaism, Levinas, not to mention, even Henry Putnam, you know, he's a mathematical logician, but he's taught uh, Maimonides, Rosenzweig, uh, Buber, and uh, uh, Levinas. And that's true with people in the study of Greek philosophy, you know, like uh, you know, spiritual exercises from Socrates to Michel Foucault and so forth. So this is, a, this is a new situation. So the worry that we normally had before uh, may, have, may have been uh, you know, trans, transfigured in a, in, a, in a new way. But the second issue, uh, my sense is, uh, no, normally we don't hear this, the Chinese complaint. This is, you know, never heard it before. The Chinese complaint is this. China is uh, extremely nervous about sovereignty. Anything else, you know, if this, for, for example, the Taiwan issue, 
If there's any problem about sovereignty, they're going to use force. Why? It's not the will of the leader. It's the, the, the sentiments are so strong. Maybe they seize it ever since they made forth to be patriotic. So China would be unified. If anyone is considered suspicious, who may want to split China, you know, no matter how, this is one big problem. The other problem is the whole conception of where is Tibet. The Chinese is very focused. Tibet is uh, where you know, uh, Lhasa and that plateau, that's Tibet. But the conception of cultural Tibet, you know, my idea of cultural China, cultural Tibet, is so threatening, not just, to the, uh, uh, not just uh, to the government officials, to the intellectuals. They say, my gosh, you know what is Dalai Lama's idea of Tibet? That includes part of Sichuan, that's uh, Deng Xiaoping's home, and includes uh, maybe two thirds of Chinese territory. You know, this whole idea of cultural concept and the political concept, that nuance is never worked out. And then when you get into the question, let's say statements are made clearly, there's a difference between independence and autonomy, clearly. But the lines are so blurred in terms of, uh, in terms of the different kind of interpretations. So in Chinese, I mean, the Chinese language, you have one image and one perception. And in, in the rest, all the other languages. The Chinese is so unique in this particular case. It's uh, the, the linguistic forces are, are so powerful. And uh, uh, well, it would take a while. But I'm not as uh, pessimistic as many other people believe that uh, the situation is not going to change uh, for decades to come. I, I think it will change very fast. But given the current misunderstanding, the change may turn out to be a change nobody wants, right? That could turn out to be explosive. <clears throat> but the change will, will occur, and hopefully any of us who's sensitive about this and uh, will be able to make a little bit of uh, you know, contribution. And especially the Olympics, when the Olympics occur. And uh, China in that moment is uh, so nervous that any kind of critique be considered as a threat to China's sovereignty. And once you have the whole, you know, the whole uh, relay got uh, politicized. So that's, that's one of the very unfortunate situations there. Last question. Thank you so much. Sorry. Last question. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, in China, we often hear about uh, opening and reform. And the Chinese talk about, they have this notion of taking the good things from the West and excluding the bad things. And we see this most recently with the, uh, the Google incident. Is there a way to let in only filter in the good things and keep the bad things out? And can you comment on that? I think uh, recently I heard, I think it must be a a scholar from India, not Ashish Nandi, but someone who said uh, this, uh, uh, the East has borrowed the worst from the West, and the West has borrowed the best from the East. What he, he has in mind is that uh, you know, uh, our society is enriched by uh, all kinds of spiritual exercises, from yoga, from uh, uh, all kinds of other forms of meditation from India. And uh, also uh, the West benefits a great deal from uh, many of the uh, uh, traditions from China. Very early, probably still in the, in the May 4th, uh, the comparison is done in a really amazing way. China decided to define the Chinese national characters in the worst possible, uh, worst possible situation you can imagine. So China find the worst possible um, Confucian expressions to define themselves, uh, e even including opium smoking and uh, cocu cocupinage, uh, spitting, all these things. Uh, these are the acu spirit. And the West is defined in terms of uh, democracy, rights, um, and equality and so forth. So the, the gap is just incredible. Situation now is changing. I don't think it's, it's possible at all for any society when it's open 
to allow only the things you, desirable for you. Uh, normally, if the uh, society is relatively close, China is still relatively close, the worst will come in very fast, and the really deep, uh, important values would not be able to do so. So my, my uh, recommendation is that instead of uh, engage in a totally uh, unfair comparison, your worst uh, against their best. And this is the time for a kind of dialogue uh, among core values. And uh, the so-called dialogue among core values is to accept the fact that society is shaped by uh, values and, of course, disvalues of various kinds. And yet, if it's possible for an interchange of uh, the best you think the human society ought to be. Uh, for example, the choice between liberty and uh, sympathy, which you think is more important for human flourishing, or rationality and sympathy, um, social harmony or dignity of the individual. And these are not, you know, you know there's not uh, either or choice, but there are a lot of interesting debates that can occur between civilizations with their own cherished ideas. And, and then I think uh, we have to recognize the fact when the society is open, then all kinds of forces will come in beyond your control. Thank you very much. Very privileged to have this discussion. Thank you all for being here. Please come again. Thank you. Thanks for coming.